Hello, I'm Faye Jensen, the CEO of the South Carolina Historical Society. Thank you for joining us for these talks on the colonial history of our state. It's the goal of the Historical Society to tell the story of all South Carolinians from all walks of life and to discuss the history of the nation through the eyes of our state. This presentation is just one of the ways that we do that. Our speaker today is William S. Davies. Mr. Davies practiced law in Columbia, South Carolina for 37 years before his retirement in 2009. He is a member of the South Carolina Bar, held leadership roles in various legal associations, and was the recipient of the South Carolina Defense Trial Attorneys Association Robert W. Hemphill Award for distinguished and meritorious service to the bar and general public. Active in community affairs, Mr. Davies has served on the board of directors of the Family Service Center, the Harvest Hope Food Bank, and the United Way of the Midlands. From 1998 to 1999, he served as president of the University of South Carolina School of Law Alumni Association. He is now serving, or has served, on the boards of several history-related organizations, including the South Carolina Historical Society, the South Carolina American Revolution Sester Centennial Commission, the Liberty Trail, the South Carolina Archives and History Foundation, the Santa Elena Foundation, the Palmetto State Military History Foundation, the Citadel Alumni Association Museum Committee, the Edisto Island Historic Preservation Society, and the South Carolina Battleground Preservation Trust. Mr. Davies earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from the Citadel and his law degree from the University of South Carolina School of Law. Prior to his time at Nelson Mullins, he served with the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General's Corps. Mr. Davies was born and had his basic education in Greenwood, South Carolina, while spending all of his summers at Edisto Beach. He has been happily married to the former Mahaley King Brown of Anderson, South Carolina since 1966. Please join me in welcoming Bill Davies. Well, thank you, Faye, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for tuning in to check out South Carolina's Lost Hundred Years. You're obviously all students of South Carolina history because you belong to the premier historic organization in the state, the South Carolina Historical Society. But I think what I'm going to tell you today, for the most part, will be things that you may not have heard before. Um, they might give a little different slant on things you did here. And the exciting thing is they're things that we've really only learned in the last 30 years, and we keep learning. This is a dynamic learning curve we're on with this part of our history. So what I'd like to do today is correct some things, talk about some things that we were told in school that may not be right, but interest you in this period of time, this time between uh, Columbus and the formation of our state. In most of our schooling, we started off with the old ditty, um, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And then we jumped to 1607 when the English landed in Jamestown. And very soon after that, we skipped, we left Virginia and went to Massachusetts with the Pilgrims and Thanksgiving. And then we had South Carolina history and we learned that the most important date in the history of mankind was 1670 when Charlestown was founded. And here in Charleston where we are today, they still believe that. But what happened in between? Well, in 1492, Spain was bankrupt. Ferdinand and Isabella had to borrow money to send Columbus to the New World. They were pushing the Moors out of Spain for the first time in 750 years, and that was very expensive. So Spain is bankrupt in 1492. That's something that's important to remember. Also at this time, Martin Luther has appeared. The Protestant Reformation is taking place. Catholics and Protestants are killing each other all over Europe because they worship the same God in a different manner. And whatever side you're not on is a heretic. It's the way things were. But at that point, 
this is very influential in what's going on. So by 1494, the Pope, who was a Catholic, divides this new world between two strongly Catholic countries, Portugal and Spain. Portugal gets basically Brazil, and Spain gets the rest, which sounds a little unfair with what we know today. But we need to look at it as they knew it then. And I want to do that by showing you what's missing between these things that we've talked about and by showing you the first known place name in South Carolina. And what's missing is the first place name, the first known place name in all writings we've been able to discover in what is now our beautiful state of South Carolina. That name is Santa Elena. And the fact that that name is not in English is important, in my mind at least. You see, I think all of our educational system is set up on an English-centric basis. We learn about people who speak English. But the time period that we're talking about today are times that in South Carolina we only had the indigenous Americans and the Spanish and the French. So they weren't speaking English. So I think that's why we didn't learn about these things. So let's go back to 1492 and realize that at that point, Spain is bankrupt. Ferdinand and Isabella had to borrow money to send Columbus to the New World. And at this point, Martin Luther has come in. The Protestants are fighting the Catholics all over Europe. They're killing each other because the other group worships the same God in a different manner. They are heretics. No matter which side you're on, the other side's a heretic. Um, that's, that's something to think about. But in looking at the fact that the division of the New World occurred in a strange manner, we need to look at a map of that day and time. And the one I'm going to use for you today is a map that was published in late 1526 by a guy named Juan Vespucci, an Italian living in Spain. In Vespucci's map, you can see that they know the outlines of Europe and Africa fairly well. They know a good bit about the east coast of South America. The Caribbean, Caribbean, however you want to say it, um, is okay. But above that and the rest of those continents, they don't know much about. But if you look at this land mass, that may be a somewhat equal division. So let's go back to what happens in the New World. It was not until 1513 that the Spanish left the islands of the Caribbean and sailed north. They sent a guy you've heard of, Ponce de Leon. He was not looking for the Fountain of Youth. This is the first fake news. He never looked for the Fountain of Youth. That's only added to him after his death. But he sails north. They don't know what's up there. And he runs into what he thinks is another big island like Cuba. And he names that island La Florida. And that's important because La Florida then is taken as the name of the Spanish colony that includes all of North America above Mexico, all of 49 of the present United States. So when I refer to La Florida, that's what I'm talking about. So Ponce de Leon sees this new place, they name it, He's goes, he goes back south, and that's what they call North America from that point forward. Then in 1519, Cortez moves across and invades what we call Mexico. He defeats the Aztecs, a tremendously advanced civilization with lots of wealth, jewels, gold and silver particularly. And that money starts going across the ocean back to Spain, which is still bankrupt. Then in uh, 1526, the Spanish decide they need to colonize La Florida. So they put 600 soldiers and settlers in about six or eight ships, and they sail north to this new place, La Florida. They go along the coastal ways, and then they sail into the most magnificent harbor that some of the sailors had ever seen, this beautiful harbor. And they sail into it on the feast day in the Catholic Church of St. Helen. And they pick out the most notable point of land, a headland, and they named that headland Capo de Santa Elena because it's St. Helen's Day. Capo de Santa Elena is on an island in this beautiful harbor. 
Now these Spaniards eventually end up setting up a new settlement down on the Georgia coast. They call it San Miguel de Galdapi. Now remember as we go forward, we talk about these different settlements. They build a fort because of the Indians. And a fort back then is vertical posts stuck side by side like John Wayne used to have in the movies. And that's important as you go forward for different reasons, for modern reasons. So just keep this in mind. Anytime the Europeans leave a fort, the Indians burn it, which is a good thing because it leaves an outline of ashes. And we can carbon date ashes. So it helps us when we find these archaeological sites. So here's what, uh, here's what the San Miguel people did. They built a fort. In about three and a half months, which is kind of the lifespan of historic settlements along the coast, uh, they're down from 600 settlers to 150. They've had mutinies. They've had uh, desertions. They've had starvation. And the thing that we don't remember, we remember about the fact that Columbus brought all these diseases to the New World. The New World had diseases. And disease killed a number of these Spaniards. So that after about three and a half months, they sail south. They shut it down. San Miguel no longer exists. This is another bit of fake news, though. About a year ago, Jamestown, up in Virginia, um, to attract more tourists, decided we need a new, new byline. And so they started advertising over the fact that in 1619, the first African-American slaves arrived in the New World in North America um, at Jamestown. The National Park Service bought into it. And that's wrong. It's, it's just obviously wrong. They didn't do their homework. But there's a national organization now called the 1619 Foundation. But in actuality, San Miguel de Galdapi had African-American slaves. We know that. We can almost name about eight or nine of them, but we think there were probably 40 or 50. In Walter Edgar's wonderful book on South Carolina history, he calls this place the site of the first slave revolt in South Carolina, or in, in North America. Um, the reason being that at the first time the mutiny occurred between the different groups of Spaniards, the majority of those slaves headed west. Following San Miguel de Galdapi in about seven years in 1533, Pizarro goes down to Peru and conquers the uh, Incas. The Incas are a very advanced society with a lot of wealth, jewels, gold, and silver, and money again starts going across the Atlantic Ocean back to Spain. So that by the 1550s, Spain is the wealthiest and most powerful country in all of Europe by far because of all this wealth that's coming from the New World. But how did they get it there? Gold and silver is heavy. And the ships back then were very small. For those football fans in the audience, they were about the length of two Clemson first downs. Um, they'd blow over very easily and they couldn't carry a lot. So how did they get them back? Well, they did a lot of trial and error. And this slide that I'm showing you now on the Spanish treasure fleet shows how they got it back. What they worked out after a lot of trial and error was for a whole year they would bring the loot they were getting from the local Americans, the indigenous Americans, and that's what it was. They were stealing it or making them work as slaves to dig more of it. They'd bring it into Havana. And they'd keep it there until late August or early September. And then they'd load it on a treasure fleet, lots of these little tiny ships. And they would sail north, as you can see on this slide, up the Gulf Stream to an area off the North Carolina coast where something happened important and they could sail back. Now let's talk about something happening important. This is how you got to and got back to, you got to Americas and you got back to Europe back in this day. It's something called prevailing winds. Europe is north of the Caribbean. So you would sail south to the Canary Islands and fill up with water, and then if you got there in mid-March, early March, that time period, a wind would come up that would blow from east to west, the prevailing wind, and it would blow long enough and strong enough to get you into the Bahamas where those three dark arrows are pointing to the Bahamas. But to get back, 
you had to sail north to the coast of North Carolina and wait until the fall, late October, early November. And the prevailing wind reversed and took you back to the Azores and you could water up and then go on to the rest of Europe. So you had to go in this time cycle and that's why the treasure fleet had to leave Havana in late August or early September because they had to get up to North Carolina by the middle of November at the latest. Two major problems, those who live in South Carolina should understand this, late August, early September, things happen with names. Hugo's the one that comes to mind, but Dorian, Matthew, Irma, whatever, we've have, that's Hurricane Alley where they're going. They're going right up the Gulf Stream through the area where most of the hurricanes track during September, August, that time period. The second problem, I'm gonna give you a person's name and I think almost every one of you will have a mental image of his face. His name's Johnny Depp. And the problem is Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates were a major problem back then. The Pope gives this new area to two Catholic countries. Everybody else is left out and they don't like it. England at this time was known as a pirate nation because they had no intrinsic wealth. So they had to take it from somebody else. The English, the French, the Dutch, everybody else is over here as pirates and they're trying to, to steal one or, two or more of those ships out of the treasure fleet every year. So you've got those two problems. In 1556, Spain crowned a new king, a guy named Philip II. I'd never heard of Philip II before I started reading about Santa Elena. Um, I now think he's probably one of the five most important people in the history of Europe, maybe in the top three. Um, Philip ruled until 1598, which gave him a lot of time. The Philippines are named after Philip. Uh, at one time or another, he ruled most of Europe. He was married to a queen of England who had a child, but he served as the king of England for four years. I mean, it, it's amazing what he did. Read about him. He's, he's worth the effort. But Philip, within one year, put out a four-point plan to outline Spanish strategy that included South Carolina for the next 30 years. Here's what he said, number one, I'm a politician, I have to have the money. You've gotta get me the treasure fleet every year. We can't lose any, any ships from the treasure fleet. Number two, because of that, we need to protect the coast of La Florida. We need settlements, but my primary settlement will be at Santa Elena, which you see on this slide that's still in front of you. And there's a reason for that. Number three in his program was, I want you to go over to Santa Elena, establish our capital there, and then I want you to cut me a road from there to Mexico so that we can bring all this gold and silver to Santa Elena by land. And then we can leave in late October or mid-October and still catch the wind. And we avoid Hurricane Alley, we avoid the pirates. And then sort of as an afterthought, and I'm going to skip back to this map by uh, Vespucci. Um, while you're sailing up and down the coast, try to go around the top of La Florida and get me to Florida where we were trying to go back in 1492. That was kind of an afterthought. In any case, that set the stage. All these other countries now want their piece of the pie. And in the 1560s, this erupted in sort of a, into sort of a world war. In 1562, the French government decided they wanted to stake their claim to La Florida. At this point, France is 85% Catholic, 15% French Huguenot, Protestants. For some reason, they pick a French Huguenot to come over. They call in a guy named Jean Ribot, a very experienced sailor, and they say, Rebo, I want you to take 150 men, a couple of ships, go over to La Florida and stake our claim. And to stake our claim, we've got 10 or 12 of these huge stone columns with the coat of arms of France already carved upon them. And use those to stake our claim along the way. And when you find a good place, establish a settlement so we can claim that we possess the land by occupation. 
So Ribot sails over. It's kind of late in the year, but he sails over. He goes up the coast, and he puts in five or six of these things. And then he sails into that same magnificent harbor, and he's the one that named it a magnificent harbor. He said, it's the, it's the greatest harbor I've ever seen in all my years of travel. And interestingly enough, he picks a point for his settlement. Now, this is a slide that shows you a picture of Ribot drawn by one of his sailors in 1562. It's probably a pretty good likeness. And on the top right of this slide is a colorized version of a map that either that same sailor or another artist in the group drew. That triangular island is, by happenstance, the location of Capo di Santa Elena, and it's also the place that Ribot picked for his settlement. He builds his fort there. He calls it Charles Fort after the French king. That island today is known as Paris Island. It's where the Marines are. It's in Beaufort County. It's in South Carolina. This is the first attempted Protestant settlement in North America. It's in South Carolina, and I bet your school teachers didn't tell you. But we need to know that. Okay. So Ribot says, I'm going to leave 28 of you guys here. I'm going to sail back because I've got to catch these winds. And then in the spring, I'll come back bringing a lot more people and ships and everything. Hang on until March or April. He sails back. He gets thrown into an English prison for reasons we don't need to go into. So he doesn't come back. But it doesn't matter because in about three and a half months, these guys have made the Indians so mad, the Indians are killing them. And they build a ship and they head back out. So... By 1563, um, 64, they're gone. The French king finds out about this. He gets upset. He wants to get somebody back to La Florida. So he sends an expedition under one of uh, Ribot's lieutenants, because Ribot's still in jail in England. And they come over, they sail up the coast to the mouth of the St. John's River, and they build a new fort called Fort Caroline. It's where Jacksonville is now. So Fort Caroline is there, the French are back. Philip, of course, hears about all this. He is furious. This is land that the Pope gave to Spain. Now, when you're a Catholic, if the Pope gives you something, that's God. God gave, this is God-given land that Spain owns. He wants these heretics, Protestants, but he wants the French, too, out of there. So he calls in his most capable uh, leader, a guy named Pedro Menendez de Avias. And he says, Menendez, I want you to get up an expedition and go over there and attack Fort Caroline, wipe them out, and then I got two more things for you to do. Go up to San Elena and set up my capital like I told you guys to do, and then make me a road to Mexico where I can get everything by land to Santa Elena. While Menendez is gathering his troops up, Ribot gets out of jail. The French want to send a, they know that Menendez is doing this, so they want to send a relief group over to Fort Caroline. So the two of them are trying to gather these competing expeditions. They know about each other. And they set sail late in the season uh, on parallel tracks across the Atlantic. Ribot's a little bit to the north. He gets into Jacksonville or Fort Caroline uh, without a whole lot of problem, and they start reinforcing the, the defenses at, at Fort Caroline. Menendez sails a little further to the south and runs into a storm. It's not a hurricane, wrong time of year. But it shatters his feet, fleet. It, they, they get damaged ships and they get spread out. So instead of going straight to Fort Caroline to attack it, um, on this new slide, you can see at the top, that's where Fort Caroline is, the mouth of the St. John's River. And then Menendez, instead of going straight there, has to land and set up a temporary military camp, un, uh, unanticipated, at a place that he calls St. Augustine. And so St. Augustine is founded on August the 9th, 1565, August again. The Spaniards find out that the French are there. The French find out the Spaniards are there. Both of them want to attack. Menendez's ships are damaged. So he starts marching in a clockwise motion 
from St. Augustine to attack Fort Caroline. At the same time, Ribot puts his men on his undamaged ships and starts sailing down to attack the Spanish. This is late August, and sure enough, a hurricane comes up, and it really just destroys the French fleet. About 80 of them land in this slide down near the number five, Matanzas Inlet, including Ribot. Menendez is marching through the wind and the rain, and he makes it to Fort Caroline, captures the fort, and because these are heretics, he gives them two choices, convert or die. And they won't convert, so he kills them. His, Philip said, get rid of them. They're heretics. He killed them because they're heretics, not because they're Frenchmen. He comes back to St. Augustine, finds out about the remainder of the French fleet, goes down to Matanzas Inlet, Get, captures all of those, including Ribot, gives them the same choice with the same result. He kills them. Matanzas Inlet is still named that because Matanzas is a Spanish word for slaughters. Menendez goes back. His ships are repaired, so he sails up to Santa Elena, and he establishes Santa Elena. On this side, you see Paris Island. This is a modern slide. And you'll see where Santa Elena is. Now remember, Charles Fort is about 300 meters from where the first Santa Elena settlement is. These are all on this ocean side of Paris Island, which is really good. The Marines built all of their barracks and everything more toward Beaufort. This area, because it's got a great view of the Sound and even the Atlantic Ocean, of course becomes the officer's golf course. Um, so all of these sites that we're going to talk about have only been under fairways. And so there's no building, there's no pilings, there's nothing. These are some of the most pristine archaeological sites in North America. That's an aside, but in any case, you now know where this is. But in 1516, as you see in, in this slide, Santa Elena is established. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. You remember Menendez was made governor general I mean, Captain General and Governor of La Florida. And you remember what La Florida was? North America. So here we have in 1566, the first capital of the United States. And the first president is Menendez. And I'll bet you weren't told that in school. And I bet you hadn't seen it in many books because we're still learning this stuff. But we know that happened in 1560. 1566, that's 450 years ago, and some of us are already celebrating the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. This is 200 years before that, and it's right here, and we don't know about it. So I think it's important that we look at how that works. Now, Menendez is, is a pretty sharp guy. He knows that they can't make it on their own. And so he appoints a lieutenant governor, a guy named Esteban de los Alos. And he says, you hang on here. I'm going to go down to the Caribbean and send more people and more supplies and all up to you. And that's what he does. And in fact, by late July of 1566, Captain Juan Pardo arrives with 300 more soldiers. Ships have been, been sent up with supplies during that period of time. So... Uh, de Los Alos makes it through that three and a half month period. Pardo and De Los Alos get Santa Elena established. And by the end of November, De Los Alos calls Pardo, Pardo, uh, Pardo in and says, Juan, we've got to do the other thing that King Philip wants us to do. So I want you to take half your men and I want you to march to Mexico. And we're worried about the French coming back. So I need you back here with those 150 men by the middle of March. Again, three and a half months. All you got to do is walk from Beaufort to Mexico. And mark a road, by the way, while you're at it. And then walk back. They have no idea the distance involved. There's a, a reason that, and we don't need to go into why, but there's a reason they think the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains are the same mountain ranges, which would shorten that distance significantly, but still. Pardo says, yes, sir, and on this slide you can see where Pardo goes. He goes to about Branchville, turns right, goes up to Orangeburg, turns left, goes through Lake Waterie, goes up to Spartanburg, 
into the middle of North Carolina, goes to the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee, and gets back by the 15th of March, 500 miles. He follows this convoluted path because that's, that, those were the Indian trails, and he, wouldn't, he was trying not to break a new trail. The French don't come, so he does it again the next year. Uh, this guy did a lot of hiking, um, but he's pretty good at it. And again, the exciting part of this is just a year ago, we totally unexpectedly, we, we, we'd been looking for it, but for years we'd been looking for it, we found yet another one of those little forts you see on the slide up in North Carolina. And again, it's a pristine archaeological site. It, the archaeologists go crazy. We don't have time to talk about part of it, so let's move along. In 1569, as you see on this slide, a large number of settlers arrive. At this point, they've got over 90 homes at Santa Elena, down on the golf course. They've got a Catholic church. They've got two or three stores. They've got barracks. They've got forts. They've got farms. They've got all sorts of stuff. It's thriving. In 1571, as you see on this slide, Menendez moves to Santa Elena with his whole family. And he builds this house. Now, the first time I started giving this talk, somebody said, you don't know what his house looked like. I do know what his house looked like. The amazing thing is, when the scholars started going to Madrid in the mid-90s, they found out that the Spanish government and the Catholic Church keep better records than the Germans. And they found the architectural drawings of Menendez's house. And that's what it looked like. And you see the footprint of it underneath the picture of the house. That's important because when Santa Elena was evacuated, the Indians burned all this stuff. And we found the footprints. And we can carbon date them. And we knew the distances that the measurements of Menendez's house. I can take you right now with a folding chair and have you stick your feet in that fireplace where Menendez warmed his feet 450 years ago. If you like history, that's pretty cool. Now, cool is a dated expression. I know that's from my time. My, my grandchildren would say awesome, but in any case, that's pretty cool to me. And it's right here in South Carolina, and nobody told us about it. And it it's extremely frustrating to me. All right, let's go forward. Um, this is what Santa Elena was. Santa Elena eventually was, as Philip, these are Philip's words, Santa Elena must be settled before all other points. And he went on to say that will be the capital. Santa Elena from 1566 lasted until 1576 as the capital of the entire present United States, less Hawaii. In 1576, by that time, Menendez has gone back to Europe. He's gotten, he's died on another military expedition. His successes didn't do real well. The Indians started ambushing him. And finally, the women of the settlement forced the commander to close Santa Elena. The women do whatever they want to do. And then the rest of us do it too. But anyway, they literally closed it. They took the capital and all the people down to St. Augustine. And by that, after that, the capital was in St. Augustine. But the military knew Philip wasn't going to put up with that, so they immediately sent a bunch of soldiers back up. They reestablished Santa Elena. But of course, when they were gone, the Indians burned everything that was there. So about uh, three or four months later, the Spanish are back in South Carolina, and they stay there until the summer of 1587. So that's 21 years in all, and that's why this slide mentions 21 years. <clears throat> You've got the first capital, the first president, the first attempted Protestant settlement. Um, the, this could be where America began, and we should be claiming that heritage. I mean, why not? And for goodness sakes, at least teach it in our schools. It, um, as I say, it's very frustrating. What happened is, in 1586, a pirate, a guy you've heard of, a guy named Sir Francis Drake, came over to the Caribbean and burned 10 or 12 Spanish cities. He was working for Queen Elizabeth I, who had helped pay for his expedition. So the government in England's involved in this. That's why it's called a pirate nation at times. He sails up, he burns St. Augustine. He leaves St. Augustine saying he's going to burn Santa Elena, but he misses us. 
goes by at night or in a storm. And then by the next year, Philip has decided he's going to conquer England rather than fighting over in the New World, and so he sends something called the Spanish Armada. And of course, that didn't work out real well. But in any case, the Spanish in 1587 pulled back, and their occupation in South Carolina ends at that point. But now let's go forward. Here's what we were told in school. Not long after 1587, in fact about 20 years, the English sailed into Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> At least in my schooling, we were told that they came in in these huge canoes, that's what the Indians called them, and they had these mountainous sails on top of them, and they had all this technology. They had cannon, they had the predecessor of the musket. They had a lot of stuff that the Indians could use, too, a lot of metal tools, uh, metal hoes and shovels and knives and hatchets and all this stuff, and one of the most important things <laughs> particularly to the women, they had metal needles. Now, the Indian women had been sewing ever since sewing was invented with bone needles or wood needles, and they break. These metal needles would. I mean, this was a big thing. So they had all this stuff, and we're told that there was a myth in the Indian tribes, the Algonquin tribes, that gods would come from the east on the water and would make their life wonderful. And so they identified, we were told, they identified these English as these gods from the East. And so they put up with the activity of the people from Europe for a period of time. But, but of course, we started stealing food from them and all that stuff. So the war developed. And, and along comes the guy that I loved as I was growing up, a fellow named Walt Disney. And he makes all these great historic movies. My favorite, literally, was the one about Jamestown. And, the image I have in my mind, whether I've made it up or whether it's really from that long ago, is of this large Indian with not a lot of clothes on, um, pointing his finger down at this Englishman, blonde Englishman. He's kneeling down. He's got his hands tied behind his back. He's got on one of those big steel chest protectors. He's got one of those cute little iron helmets on that look like a rocking chair. Um, they look kind of silly to me. But anyway, there he is. And, of course, the big Indian is a chief named Powhatan, a historical figure. We know he existed. And the Englishman is John Smith, Captain John Smith, who allegedly saved the whole Jamestown expedition. And the, Engl the Indian is saying, kill him. And about this time, coming straight from the makeup trailer, comes this beautiful young lady with her hair all done up, got this white uh, deerskin outfit on with beads all over it, she runs up, throws herself across the Englishman and says, Daddy, Daddy, please don't kill him. This is my childhood sweetheart, Pocahontas. Pocahontas is, is a real person. We think this event may or may not have happened, but in any case, we were told it happened. I always thought Pocahontas should have married John Smith. She didn't. She married John Rolfe. That's another story. But anyway, that's all what we were told. But now let's go back and look at what really happened. I want to take you back out of... Um, out of, con out of uh, our chronology a little bit, to 1561, the year before Rabeau comes over. At that point in time, the Spanish knew about Chesapeake Bay, but they needed to explore it. They wanted to have a settlement there. So when the treasure fleet went north in late August, early September, they made it through. One of the ships that had a specific purpose to do this peels off and goes into Chesapeake Bay. They landed on the peninsula between the York and the James Rivers. They set up this huge display of all these trade goods that they had brought with them. Colored wool blankets, cotton um, needles, knives, everything else. They had food, they had rum, called in the local Indians. And they basically had a marketing campaign. They were only there for six days, so they didn't make them mad. Um, they said, look, we're going to make you all the, the chiefs of the whole country. You're going to have Indians coming in here from hundreds of miles away because what we want to do is set up a trading post here and we'll have ships full of this stuff. This is a little bit. We're going to give you this. But we'll have ships and they can come in and trade and they'll think since you are the friends of the white men, you're the big deal. All we need is for you to give us a couple of you young men so we can find our way back here. So two of the young Indian boys volunteer. One is a chief's son, Pequiquineo, 
you don't, don't even try to write it down. But Pequiquineo and his friend get on the ship with the Spaniards. They, they sail across the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, they've told the Indians they're coming back the next year. They don't. They don't come back until 1566. They go back to Havana at this point. Pequiquineo and his friend are put with some Dominican friars, and they go up the coast with the idea of peeling off into Chesapeake Bay. But a storm comes up and blows them by it. Those ships can't go back against the wind, so they go back to Spain. They don't come back until 1570, nine years after they left home, Pequiquineo and his friend. And this time they go over near Veracruz in Mexico, and they're there for four months. And that's important because in Veracruz they can tell how the Spanish really treat the indigenous Americans. And it was not good. They had enslaved them, they had stolen all their wealth, they made them continue to dig gold and silver and do other things, and they treated them very, very harshly. And Pequiguneo and his friend would have seen that. The two of them then went back to Havana. They're put with six Jesuit priests this time, and they sail from Havana to go back to Chesapeake Bay. They stop in Santa Elena. Nine Jesuit priests, Pequiquineo and his friend, and they add Alonzo, the tailor's son, as the altar boy. And the group of them sail up. They go into the Chesapeake Bay. They land. They march about eight or nine miles inland, and they establish something called the Aja Khan Station. It's a missionary station. You've got nine Jesuit priests, Alonzo, Pequiquineo, and his friend. The Indians come around. They greet Pequiquineo and his friend. They're, they're long-lost brothers, all that stuff. Pequiquineo and his friend stay with the Spanish for a while, and then they start taking long weekends at the Indian villages, and then they kind of stay at the Indian villages, and then they decide that it's more fun to be an Indian than it is to be a Catholic because they both converted. And... This is in the history. Uh, monogamy had a lot to do with it, okay? So, Pequiquineo and his friend lead a war party. They come in and, and kill all the nine Jesuits. They adopt Alonzo into their tribe. Menendez hears about this. He sends a military expedition. They hang 40 or 50 Indians, but they can't catch Pequiquineo and his friend. They do get Alonzo back. So, Alonzo returns home. Now, let's scope forward that 20 years. And let me fill in what happened in the meantime. Pequiquineo, you remember, was the son of a chief. Pequiquineo became a chief. He had a son. Guess what he named him? Powhatan. So this is, in my colloquialism, cool. My grandchildren, awesome. My girlhood, my childhood sweetheart, Pocahontas, is Pequiquineo's granddaughter. This makes it personal. But you don't think Pequiquineo told them about his nine years living all over the world? He's gone across the Atlantic Ocean four times. He's lived in Cadiz. He's lived in Seville. He's lived in Madrid. He met with Philip regularly. Philip paid his bills. Bought him food, bought him clothes, the whole business. He's come, he's, when he came back over here in Mexico, he sees all the things that are going on there. He and his friend have both learned to speak, read, and write Spanish. You have to do most of those to be a Catholic, and they have converted. So when the, and by the way, about eight or nine years ago, we found the remains of the Ajacan mission. It's about a little less than 10 miles from Jamestown. So when these English ships sail into the Chesapeake Bay, the Indians know all about European culture. What they're seeing is illegal immigrants, and they're wishing they'd built a wall. They didn't see gods coming in. They would not have accepted them like that. We were taught that, and it's wrong. It's in a bunch of the, the school books. It's wrong. They would have known immediately. They would have been reticent to welcome those people to their new lands. So the way this went down would have been very different from what we were told. Now remember, 1607 is Jamestown. It's in Virginia. The Spanish still think all of that is part of La Florida. They don't like the Spanish being there. So they try to get the Indians to attack Jamestown. 
And then comes 1670 when we come into Charleston, a lot closer to Florida. They really don't like us here. In 1686, the Spaniards got together a major military expedition. It sails up the coast. It burns out settlements near Beaufort. It burns some homes on Edisto Island. And they head for Charleston to wipe it out. And they've got plenty of men and equipment to do that in 1686. And a hurricane comes up. It's the fall. And they're shipped back to Florida. But then if you follow our colonial series, you'll hear about the Yamasee War. The Yamasee War is caused by the Spanish trying to get the Indians to keep attacking the English up here in La Florida, in their backyard, in the land God gave them. The Spanish don't give up until the end of the Seven Years' War, what we call the French and Indian War, in 1763 when they cede all of this land to the English. But that's the real story of our lost hundred years. And my goal is to hope that you will be interested enough to follow that a little bit. But let's kind of bring it up to date. Um, in 1923, the new commandant at the Marine Corps base down there was an amateur archaeologist, and he started digging around under the area that became the golf course, and he found what he thought was Charles Fort, and he convinced Congress of that, so that in 1926, Congress go comes down to uh, Paris Island and builds this tremendous concrete column to celebrate Ribot and the, the stakes that he brought over from France. It's not, he found Santa Elena, he didn't find Charles Fort. Charles Fort was about 300 meters away. But anyway, that's where the monument is, and the monument's still there to this day. Um, then in the late 1970s, there was a little interest, but it wasn't until the mid-1990s that scholars really started focusing on this thing. So most of what I've been telling you is information that we've learned in the last 25 or 30 years. Um, what they do is they go into this area and they dig down to what they're looking for and they do their research because the money's limited and then they fill it back up to keep it protected. And I've got a picture here of some of the archaeology and then in this period of time as you see from this slide we found most of the forts. So while this is a developing project there are things you can do to follow up. There are books you can read obviously. But on Hilton, if you, what I'm encouraging all of you to do is go down to Beaufort, spend a weekend. It's a nice, beautiful little seacoast town, lots of good food and all that stuff. Um, at Hilton Head Island, there is the Coastal Discovery Museum, which has the Santa Elena Center in it. That's worth visiting. But as soon as the pandemic is over, and we're filming this, of course, in the middle of the pandemic, but Paris Island is going to reopen, and what you could do before this happened and what you, we think you'll be able to do uh, after it is go to the main gate at Paris Island, and you bring just things you normally have in your car, your new driver's license, your car registration, and your proof of insurance, and your driver can get in. The passengers either have to have the new driver's license or the passport, but they will give you a map to go to the museum on Paris Island, and it's a good little museum, and it has a Santa Elena room in it. And then you can go out past the clubhouse for the officer's golf course and arrive at the site of Santa Elena, where 450 years ago, Jean Ribot started the first attempted Protestant settlement in the New World in South Carolina, and where Pedro Menendez de Avias and his family dug their garden and where he put his feet up beside that fireplace that you can see from the paved path that's there. I hope you'll do that. Appreciate very much you all joining us today.